afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first Public Health Ontario's Microbiology Rounds of 2024. I couldn't think of a better way to start off this new year than with the presentation on applications of automation and AI in the Diagnostic Microbiology Lab. My name is Vanessa Tran, and I am a clinical microbiologist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the absolute pleasure today of moderating uh, today's session. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distraction during the presentation, so please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. Uh, a discussion and question period will follow the presentation. Um, if at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would like to state that as the moderator of the session, I have some conflicts of interest to disclose. I am on the board of the Canadian College of Microbiologists and Canadian Association for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. I'm also a co-investigator or collaborator on a number of grants funded by CIHR, PHAC, and Gillian. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Lee Gano. Dr. Gano completed his doctoral training at the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Western University. Following his graduate studies, he completed a postdoctoral training program in clinical microbiology here at the University of Toronto and became a fellow of the Canadian College of Microbiologists. Since 2019, Dr. Gano has been working as the National Director of Microbiology at Dynacare, where he has led numerous initiatives, including implementation of SARS-CoV-2 testing, expanding the laboratory's molecular diagnostics portfolio, and leveraging automation, artificial intelligence, and informatics to improve quality and care. Uh, it's all very exciting work, and I'm very happy to pass it over to Lee. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk about our experience in implementing automation and AI in, in our microbiology lab. Uh, and this admittedly is a bit of a passion project. So when I was approached by um, Dr. Tran, I was very happy to be able to share our experience, and I'm hoping some of the attendees will take uh, something away from, from what we've learned. And I just wanted to uh, start off first with disclosures. Uh, I am an employee of Dynacare, as Dr. Tran mentioned. It's a private for-profit lab uh, company. And I just wanted to be clear that neither Dynacare nor myself stand to financially benefit from, from this presentation or the contents of the prepared slides. I don't have any additional conflicts to declare at this time, and this slide deck was reviewed for potential bias by the rounds committee, and the final version has been approved for presentation. So for those who haven't used it, I wanted to give an example of what this type of AI could do, and I thought what better of an opportunity to consult uh, AI, uh, our AI overlord, if you'd like, or our AI friend, maybe as a kinder way of saying it, ChatGPT, to see how um, I might want to put a presentation together, let's say, on artificial intelligence and AI applications, sorry, artificial intelligence and automation applications in the micro lab. So this is actually a screenshot taken from um, ChatGPT. And I asked the question, hi, ChatGPT, I need some help creating a PowerPoint presentation on the topic of automation and artificial intelligence in a diagnostic microbiology lab. Can you help with an outline? And not only is uh, ChatGPT and most of these generative AI language, large language models um, very knowledgeable, which is kind of their purpose, they're actually, I found to be quite polite. Uh, so ChatGPT came back with a response of, sure, I'd be happy to help you with an outline for your presentation, and here's a suggestion. And overall, I got to say, you know, um, it did pretty well. It had your introduction, you had some background on automation, artificial intelligence. Uh, you had um, ways that you might want to combine automation and AI in the diagnostic micro lab. And then what I was kind of really happy with was just like its responses for the implications for future diagnostic micro labs. So potential impact on lab workflow and staffing and potential impact on patient care and outcomes, which had nothing to do with my original question. It just kind of organically uh, came up with that on its own. And then you would obviously have your conclusion and what good presentation wouldn't have references at the end. So you'd want to source your um, references at the very end of the presentation. And it wished me luck with the presentation, uh, which I thought was very kind. So that's really the extent I'm going to talk about large language models. I could probably have an entirely other talk on it, but I think it's fascinating. I just want to get a sense of the, some of the capabilities of current uh, AI technologies that are readily available, by the way, online. So go and check it out um, if you haven't had a chance and, and see what it can do. 
Um, so the actual objectives for this talk in specific are to describe the available and emerging automation and our AI technology for the Diagnostic Microbiology Lab. I've really narrowed the scope down to specifically discuss opportunities in bacteriology just because it's just way too big of a field to kind of do justice in if I spread myself too thin. Uh, I'm going to describe the benefits, limitations, and strategies of implementing automation and AI technologies in the lab. And at the very end, I'll have a couple of slides just discussing the um, automation and AI and how it could benefit not just public health labs, public health for an example, but also any lab just in general. So I would like to set um, kind of the knowledge basis for AI. I think we all conceptually kind of understand what AI is capable of doing. But I found a nice definition uh, from IBM, which summarized AI as artificial intelligence of the field, which combines computer science and robust data sets to enable problem solving, which I thought was a pretty nice kind of summary of what AI is in a nutshell. In this talk, I'm going to be speaking a lot of machine learning, which is a subfield of AI aimed at the development of statistical algorithms that can learn from input data and then generalize to new data without specific instructions. And I'm going to show an example of that, uh, which is that image on the right. And these large or these ma machine learning um, systems can be based on supervised learning, which is really the mass um, bulk of the talk that I'm going to be talking about, or unsupervised learning, uh, which I'm not going to go into too much detail on. When we talk about supervised learning, if you just look at the figure on the right, a good example is if you were to look at images of starfish and sea urchins. And you'll basically what this is an example of. Um, in an experiment setting would be like a, a human would take a sampling of starfish and they, they look like there's five here and they would label these or annotate these things as starfish and then they would do the same thing with sea urchins and you can see the sea urchins kind of look a little different there's a, most of them four out of five have stripes and one of them has spots they're going to feed this then through a machine learning algorithm and the machine learning algorithm is going to basically start to recognize certain features that associate with starfish or sea urchins respectively and there may even be some overlap between the two but ultimately, you're going to see things in the AI, in this machine learning algorithm, like it's going to recognize the star shape. Uh, it might recognize things like these dots, and then it'll also recognize things like ovals and stripes in the case of sea urchins. And there's a statistical kind of signal associated with that. So there's a very strong signal for uh, sea stars with a star shape and um, a weaker signal of sea urchins, for example, with a star shape. So what you can then do is take a brand new image that the machine learning algorithm has never seen. Uh, so such as a picture of the ocean and it's going to look at this image and you're asking the question of is there a starfish in this image and what it's going to do it's going to look at the image and it's going to look at things like the water maybe it'll look at the fish it'll see the starfish here and the snail um, which it has not been trained on and it's going to have again the statistical kind of response where it's like yep i see a lot of association with a star shape i see a lot of association with these spots i think there's a starfish in this image um, which is shown on the right and then you have the sea snail and it's saying, well, I kind of see something that looks oval. So maybe it's a sea urchin, but I'm not really quite sure. And it's not really a strong statistical signal, but it's still kind of like this background noise. And at the end of the day, um, through modeling that goes way beyond my comprehension and statistics that go beyond my comprehension, it'll make the decision of, yes, there's a starfish based on my training uh, in this image. And there may be an urchin depending on how good the model is, uh, but it might not, I'm not super confident that it's an urchin. So it, just to summarize kind of in recontextualize kind of the, the, the field and the subfield, artificial intelligence is like this large circle that encompasses kind of everything in that field. Machine learning is a subset of that. And then you can even have what's called deep learning, which is almost a technique that replicates almost how the human brain works with artificial neural networks, completely out of scope for this talk and probably beyond my comprehension, but um, something that's very interesting as well. I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the methods and kind of the purposes of the different types of methods that are used to train machine learning algorithms and the type of applications that we often see them used in. So I'll start with supervised because I gave that example. So you can see supervised machine learning, uh, machine learning is really geared towards doing things like recognizing images. You might be able to ask it a question that will provide an answer. And it's based on basically whatever model it's been trained on by a user inputting data. Unsupervised um, machine learning algorithms have very different applications. They can do a lot of really kind of interesting things, and they're used a lot in the field of generative AI, where it's generating something, the AI is generating something that's completely new or novel, um, like it could re write creatively. So that's an example of what I gave for ChatGPT. I could have asked ChatGPT 
um, for example, to give me the presentation outline in the form of a wrap, and it would be able to do that if I wanted to. Uh, it can synthesize speech, and it can even do some really interesting things like imagine pictures, generate pictures, or videos. And just for fun, just to show again what this technology can do, I showed an example of one application. This is from Night Cafe Studio. Um, and I basically the way that this works of, for generative AI is you can put in a prompt, whatever prompt you want, and it will generate an image that it believes is associated with that prompt. So in this case, this image was generated based on the prompt microbiology automation. And you know, I, I got to admit, I can kind of see it. I think like maybe this is kind of like these that's orangey looking thing in the middle, like maybe it's like organic looking microbiology. And then you have to see all these things that kind of look like wires and some sort of technology. And the thing I love about these images is you get the overall sense of what it's trying to capture in essence, like microbiology automation technology. But when you look at things in detail individually, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for a human brain when you really start to look at it, which is, I just think an interesting phenomenon of this type of um, AI. Okay, so now moving along the rationale. Why, why are we talking about automation and AI microbiology? What, what's it trying to accomplish and how does it help us? Really just to get cut to the chase, our MLT workforce is shrinking in Canada. Um, retirements are pacing the number of new MLTs entering the workforce. And we're seeing this in the face of increasing test volumes, which is quite challenging. And this was really revealed by the pandemic, these vulnerabilities, um, you know, 70% of labs were entered the pandemic short staff, 87% of staff reported burnout or on stress leave. And 42% of staff were retiring early over that those few years of the pandemic. So it was really exacerbating an already challenging situation. And this is obviously a major risk to business continuity and equality if that workforce issue is not addressed proactively. And one of the potential approaches you could take is to mitigate that risk through technology such as laboratory automation and AI. There's a lot of benefits to be realized aside from the kind of the end goal of, you know, trying to make sure that we can continue to operate in a, in a safe and high quality manner. Um, automation and AI can do things like improve efficiency and capacity. So if you're reducing things like MLT CLA plate handling time, um, you're going to accomplish that goal of uh, reducing the requirement for FTEs to, to perform necessary operations in the lab. You can reduce human error by reducing the number of touches per specimen. And there's also improved standardization and quality. If you're following a strict diagnostic algorithm, for example, in a machine learning um, uh, AI application, it's not going to deviate from what it's been trained to do. It's very intentional, it's very tech, you know, technical. It's not able to deviate. You might see some variability from person to person, but the AI application has to follow the, the algorithm that it's been trained on, which is a, also a benefit. And then you also have your end-to-end -end traceability from sample to report, which is another added benefit. There's things that don't really go missing. Um, you have full kind of line of sight to every step in the process. Another added benefit of a lot of the systems, um, especially for um, particularly in uh, diagnostic bacteriology, is you can have decreased turnaround time. So when we're talking about classical incubation of microbial plates, you'll, you know, we always think of these ambient air incubators where you open a door, that's the image on the right there. Sorry, I don't have a pointer, but it's there. Uh, you can see some culture plates in there. Every time you open that door and close it, you're letting the nice warm air out, the pathogens or potential pathogens that are growing on the plate, they're present in the sample. They have to restart growing again. The conditions have to be um, re-optimalized before they're gonna start doing that. So um, in a lot of these advanced uh, automated systems, they're, they're closed incubators. So that, that door is never open or closed. It's all handled by robotics. Uh, which, which ultimately produces a much more optimal growth um, kind of uh, environment for, for the bugs that you're looking for. Uh, in addition to kind of along the same line of standardization, you have robotic planting on, on microbial media. This is just an example of a robotic streak versus a manual streak, and you appreciate the difference between the well-isolated colonies and just kind of how standardized that would be compared to uh, the manual streaking method. Uh, and just trying to wrap things up on the benefits, improve biosafety, you know, if you're not handling the plates as much, you're less likely to be exposed. And it, there's also this added benefit of a lot of images are generated using these smart incubators. I'm going to go into that more detail shortly, but um, you have remote culture using or telebacterology. You're looking at culture plates, not in, in hand, but actually on a monitor, which can improve safety. And overall, when you take everything com com together, you have superior organism recovery isolation, increased proportion of well isolated colonies, and enhance recovery of, and detection of slow growing or fastidious organism that really, really ultimately improves your sensitivity and diagnostic accuracy. 
And what are the advantages of bringing this type of technology in if you can overcome the um, what's usually a large capital cost to bring in the hardware? Um, but once you have the hardware and you can realize the added benefits of continuous improvement of the AI machine learning algorithm, which is uh, also a major benefit. So that being said, lots of benefits, not necessarily, you know, I think it's a really pretty picture, but it's not necessarily a, a nice walk in the park. Um, there are a lot of challenges, especially as it pertains to microbiology in, in automating a lot of the stuff that we, we currently do uh, manually. First of all, I think many people on the call will recognize that microbiology testing is complex. Labs may have dozens or hundreds of test codes which have to be navigated and each of those specimens have different media types, ways that they're gonna be planted, so on and so forth. So it is complex. And historically, microbiology has relied on manual processes ex executed by expertly trained staff. It takes years of training to make somebody really proficient in, in kind of the art of microbiology. And just to kind of hit this point home, you know, you can imagine a simple culture plate and all the stuff that we do. Uh, you have to streak the sample onto a plate. Sometimes there's different streaking patterns depending on the specimen that you're working with. There's diverse sample types and matrices that you have to deal with. Some are totally liquid, some are swabs, some are tissues, uh, and so on. There's many types of growth media and the type of media that you use for your workup is dictated by the specimen type that you receive. So that's also a challenge. And then there's manual interpretation. And sometimes we may need to even rely on the number of colonies that are on plate to, um, to understand if this uh, crosses an interpretive threshold for clinical significance or not. So looking at our, our um, proportion of tests in, in my lab, we really saw that there was kind of an opportunity specifically with urine culture. And I'm going to go into that in the next slide, but when you look at this, our, the proportion of urine culture that's done by Dynacare is almost 70% of our total volume, which, which would be wonderful if we could automate that large proportion of testing. So we really considered this low-hanging fruit for automation uh, for a few added reasons, um, just drawing on what I explained below or previously. Um, it's low complexity sample type. You always get one sample type, which is urine, and we plant in our lab on one type of media. It comprises a high proportion of daily, our daily microbiology volumes and therefore also our FD complements. And there have been technological advancements that have permitted automation and machine learning microbiology, which can be applied to urine culture. When we look at the two, the players out there, the opportunities for automation and AI, there's really two major players, which is the Copan Wasp Lab on the right, or sorry, the left, and the BDQ Throw, which is on the right. And these are the workhorses for total lab automation in microbiology. Uh, we put the two in a room, had them arm wrestle it out, and at the end of the day, we decided to go with the, the WASP lab in, in, in our lab. Um, but they're, both technologies are really great, um, very comparable. For us, it was this decision that we already had a lot of um, the pre-analytical modules, the WASP modules in place, so it made natural sense for us to implement the WASP lab. Okay, this is another AI generated image from Night Cafe. Uh, and this was generated by a WASP lab prompt. And one other thing about these AI images is the more you look at them, the more bizarre they look, but I also found many of them to be incredibly unsettling. So I don't like this, uh, <laughs> I don't like this interpretation of WASP lab as generated by um, this, this computer. So uh, we'll just move on from that. Uh, okay, so this is how the WASP lab kind of works in a nutshell. And again, I mentioned it's very similar to how the BD Keystra might work. Um, at the front end, you have advanced robotics where all the plates are, are kind of managed and the specimens are loaded and planted. They're then fed, the planted plates are then fed along a conveyor system to these smart incubators, which I mentioned are these closed incubators that have very optimal growth conditions for bacteria. Uh, and then when they're ready, they're done incubating, they're ready to be imaged, they go to the imaging module or the image. And when they're ready to come off, they come off this carousel at the back. And just to walk through the workflow very quickly, the specimen would be loaded into the wasp, it would be planted, the image would be, it would be incubated, the image would be recorded, and then we would go to image analysis. And you have a few options here. You could do your screening um, on the, what's called the web application and separate on the web application to different workflows, whatever your lab needs to do. Or you can use the machine learning um, AI component, which is uh, called Phenomatrix, to do that work for you. And this is an example of what Phenomatrix looks like. And this is machine-assisted screening. And again, what you're looking at here is um, urine culture. That's the only thing that we've been automating in our lab so far. Uh, just to orient you, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a lot of no-growth plates. So there's just nothing growing on here, and Phenomatrix has segregated these no-growth plates into a no-growth uh, plate folder. 
And then on the right hand side of that, you have examples of what positive plates might look like. So you have significant growth of E. coli at the top, that pinkish looking colony. Uh, you have gram negative bacilli in the middle, and then you have enterococcus on the on the bottom right hand side. So that phenomatrix is doing that completely on its own. Once the specimen has been loaded, uh, the technology is taken away all the way up until this point. That's the first point of human intervention for the system. Uh, so what phenomatrix is doing is basically what a person would be doing, which is segregating based on colony morphology and the color, the size, and things like that, and also the colony count to determine if this is a significant urinary tract infection or a non-significant urinary tract infection. Uh, this is in an image of our lab. This is actually another AI-generated image, and um, this is based on the image prompt implementing automation in bacteriology. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. I don't know what this is supposed to be, but it looks, it looks pretty cool. Okay, so this is just a brief summary of our project timeline. I mentioned that we had uh, pre-analytical modules for the WASP system before we moved to our automated system. We had these in 2016. We launched the project. You're not, you're not misreading this as we did launch it during the uh, pandemic. Uh, we had an opportunity we had to take advantage of, so we, we muscled through. Uh, and by August of 2021, we had our first WASP lab line installed. By June of 2022, we had phase one of our phenomatrix uh, implemented, which was automating the no growth and no significant growth. So basically what's happening is phenomatrix is separating all those no growth and no significant growth out, and they're going to trash after they've been reviewed and approved by an MLT. And then finally, in November 2022, we had our phase two phenomatrix, which was automation of the entire urine culture workflow. So looking at significant growth of E. coli, gram negative bacilli, mixed growth, and, and everything else. Um, there was a lot of planning that went into this, and this is kind of where I'm hoping to pass some experience and knowledge on to anybody that might be interested in, in exploring this for their lab. Um, there's a lot of heavy lifting pre-install. Uh, first, risk analysis is really critical, and I highly recommend um, approaching labs that have gone through the exercise of implementing either Watts Lab and Phenomatrix or or any sort of ad automation technology and AI technology, machine learning technology in their lab. Uh, in this case, we really leveraged the experience of Mount Sinai Hospital, so thank you for that. Uh, the IT requirements gathering solution design development is no, uh, it's, it's a massive task. You're really going from a manual workflow where it's very iterative from one step to the other, and there's a lot of paper, to completely removing the paper and integrating the entire workflow through to the very end to, to really take the most advantage you can out of the automation and that integration with the um, AI algorithm if you're, if you're going that route. So one example of this, because that's kind of nebulous, right? One example that we did in our lab was we often get remarks flagged on requisitions um, so we we decided that, hey, if this can be entered into the LAS, there's no reason why that information can't be passed on to WASP, to WASP lab, to the automated system, to the AI system to help define what type of workflow is going to be dictated for that urine culture. So a really good example of that is pregnant. Uh, if, if, some, if a physician enters pregnant on requisition, our LAS, this will be entered into the LAS. It's passed along all the way to the automated system and the AI. And then it'll look for uh, group B strep in that situation, specifically any amount of group B strep would be worked up in that situation. That's all done behind the scenes through this integration. Stage management is a major challenge. There's a lot of resistance a lot of the time for um, automation and AI in the lab. You really have to set expectations, proactively address concerns, you know, full transparency, information sessions, and you really want to list, list and describe the benefits of machine-assisted interpretation. This isn't just semantics. This is really important. You want to make sure that it's clear to the staff that this is not to replace anybody. This is to allow the staff to focus on the work that they need to do, um, which is the significant growth for urine cultures, as an example. If the phenomatrix will get rid of all the no growth and no significant growth. It's going to be a time saver to prevent the staff from having to manually go through and sort that, those plates. And lastly, I would recommend highly, your, uh, you know, like the total testing process review in mind that you're switching now to this continuously loading automation kind of workflow. You want to optimize your processes for automation before the machine even enters the lab and start to think of how you integrate and change your workflow uh, with the new technology that's coming. This is just a, what our lab uh, looks like. We planned our workflow um, from specimen processing through to the, these are the WASP labs here, the lines, we have two lines, uh, three double incubators and four WASP pre-analytical modules. 
Uh, these are fed through the lines and then they're offloaded to be taken to workbenches on the right hand side. So you want to think about that workflow. And yeah, like ultimately we did our installation and verification and went off fairly well. Uh, LAS interface setup was a lot of work. Uh, scientific verification, we looked at the, the incubators. Uh, we verified a shorter incubation period because of that optimal growth condition. So we changed our cultures from 18 hours to 16 hours. Uh, we had to verify the performance of the staff to be able to do telebacterology, you know, going, which was probably the biggest change for the staff is just instead of looking at the physical plates, they're now looking at the uh, plates online and on a monitor. And the WASP, as I mentioned, was fully implemented for urine cultures August 23rd, 2021, which was approximately three months after the installation had started. So some of the challenges, now I'm going to switch gears from the hardware, the handling of the place, the planning assessments, to how, how did we train uh, the AI to recognize this and kind of what were the challenges that we experienced in doing this? So just to, again, to level set for those who aren't familiar with urine culture, if there's anybody on the call, um, this is what a urine culture looks like. It's a semi-quantitative streaking pattern and the number of colonies on the plates is important for determining the workup that is going to be uh, conducted. And we use a chromogenic media in our lab. This is really in CGI clarity. Uh, it, it's just a different, bacteria basically showed as different colors on the media. And this is our list of neuropathogens, non-neural pathogens. Uh, we talked a lot to labs, every lab has a different list, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but just recognize that the, whatever that AI is gonna be doing, it's gonna have to be able to differentiate neuropathogens from non-neuropathogens that are potentially growing in the streak. This is a snippet of our SOP. We use, uh, basically don't worry about too much of the details, uh, but on the left-hand side, we look at the number of organisms, we look at the number of colonies of each type, and that ultimately will dictate the type of lab workup that we have. So it's either going to say no workup if it's zero organisms or an insignificant amount of one organism, for example, or if the culture is just so mixed, greater than or equal to three, we won't do any workup either. Um, so how do we take all this? How do we take what's showing up on the plate, our, our workflow, our algorithms that are already being used? How do we translate this from what a, you know, a human concept to kind of a machine? Uh, concept and how can we get that to a, a SIS interpretation. So the way that this works in our experience with Phenomatrix was kind of through four phases. First, we had the preliminary phase, uh, which is basically taking our processes and translating it to something that can can be accomplished using the technology. Uh, and then once we're happy with that with the with the vendor, we will then go to the development phase, which is going to train the AI machine learning algorithm against our, our um, process. We'll enter the testing phase then once, once the vendor is happy with the, 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 the algorithm, they'll hand it back to us and we'll demo the algorithm in our lab, which means running clinical samples all fly through and seeing if the MLT interpretation jives with the machine learning uh, phenomatrix interpretation. And then we'll hit the deployment phase if we're happy and we hit the ground running with our, our process then. I incorporated uh, some more details on the preliminary phase, the demo phase, the development phase, the demo phase, just for interest, the slides will be shared. I don't have time to go into the details of everything today. Um, but what I wanted to say deployment wise is after deployment, um, you know, there's, there's some things that you need to address from a change management perspective. So just looking at the phenomatrix implementation challenges at the bottom of this slide, one thing that I've heard, generally speaking, from many labs that have gone this route and implemented a machine assistant interpretation approach is there's going to be an initial increase in turnaround time. The staff are learning the system. It's a new approach to online screen. So they're going to be a little bit more slow in, in kind of making that conversion. And you really have to kind of nip in the bud a lot of the discomfort with the staff in taking a uh, place offline to do workflow offline. They, there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction like, oh, I just got to, I got to do the play in my hands. That's what I'm used to. Um, and to gain the confidence that what you're seeing on, you know, on the screen is actually just as good as what you're seeing in your hand. Um, one of the other things that we saw, which was interesting, was just kind of distrust of <laughs> the results that Phenomatrix was providing. A lot of times the staff would change the Phenomatrix result to something uh, else. Like, so for example, they would say, I don't think this is no growth. I think it's no significant growth. And they'll move the uh, result, that culture from one folder to another folder. And in a retrospective review, we actually found a lot of time that when that was being done, it was being moved to an incorrect folder. Clinically, not super impactful because no growth, no significant growth, clinically ultimately the same, but um, Phenomatrix was actually pretty good at calling and distinguishing between those things. 
Uh, and finally, there was just a failure to utilize altimetric features. So in the monitor, you're able to zoom in, you change the lighting and things like that. So just again, making sure the staff are familiar and comfortable with the system. Uh, I say machine assisted screening because I want to just highlight again that it's not perfect. It is based on a machine learning algorithm and you know uh, it's based on um, so there's limitations within the software as well, and it doesn't perform perfectly. So this is an example of one plate that was put into the mixed growth folder, which should have been assigned to the two or more folder. Uh, I want to make sure everybody rest, is rest assured that there are MLTs screening all of the phenomatrix results to make sure that they have been grouped into the proper folder before the workflow is assigned and, and results are finalized. So some of the immediate process improvements that we realized was removing kind of a lot of the paper, a lot of the boxing, a lot of hands-on stuff. That was something that we expected to see, which was really wonderful. We did have a decrease incubation time, which was good uh, from 18 to 16 hours, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we had some benefits around custom programming, again, so it's finding workflows, pregnancy, yeast, GBS, if there's special submitted requests on the requisition, we can honor those. Uh, and there was just an overall a more efficient workflow with the phenome matrix. This is probably the most important slide of the presentation. This is our finding. So at the very top you have is the operational performance changes. Um, and what we have is what was projected from the vendor and what was realized in reality from, from us. So the turnaround time was projected to decrease by 55% and it was unchanged. And the reason was we actually knew it was gonna be unchanged. The reason is, is that we can't uh, continuously feed our wasp blood system, unfortunately. Our specimens mostly come in in a bulk kind of uh, way from logistics at the end of the night. So there is a bit of a bottleneck. Um, if we were able to load the system continuously, we probably would have seen a decrease in turnaround time. Uh, productivity was increased. Um, we actually outperformed the estimation. It was about 45 to 63%. And then in terms of the technical performance of, of Phenomatrix, I just want to draw your attention. It's a bit of a complicated uh, table, admittedly. But if you want to look at the right-hand column, which is Phenomatrix versus MLT agreement, post-adjusted, you'll see that our agreement with Phenomatrix and MLT was very high for the um, no growth categories, pure E. coli categories, uh, other. So that's where Phenomatrix has did a really good job of separating out and appropriately segregating the culture results uh, into those folders. Where it didn't do so well was things like mixed growth, um, which is uh, immediately challenging. You might even have some gray and inconsistent gray areas and consistency between MLTs on that. So that wasn't a huge concern because again, these are all results that are being screened at the end of the day by an MLT. It's just that Phenomatrix is separating into the respective folders. Uh, one of the limitations currently is that Phenomatrix was overlooking microcolonies. So one of the major kind of drivers of disagreement between an MLT and Phenomatrix was in the no growth and no significant growth category. We found that a lot of the time Phenomatrix would assign um, a no growth uh, culture to a no growth folder. And upon close, close review, we would see no significant, we see these microcolonies and we say, okay, it should have been probably assigned to no significant growth, so we'll change that. But clinically not super impactful because the ultimate is just there's nothing here that's significant. This is a change in our results after the implementation of WASP lab. So this purple line is our negativity rate. Uh, our blue line is the positivity rate. And then we have mixed growth rates. And you can kind of see what's annotated here. It's just here's where WASP lab, oh, sorry, you don't can't see my pointer. You can see at the top where WASP lab was implemented, where Phenomatrix phase one was implemented and Phenomatrix phase two was implemented. And you can kind of see um, the resulting impact to test positivity, negativity rate. Um, and the biggest change was obviously WASP lab. And what we saw was a pretty dramatic reduction in the number of negatives that we were seeing and a pretty substantial increase in the number of positives that we were seeing. Now, I've just summarized that here. And what we chalked this up to uh, without like a major change in our SOPs was the improved growth conditions that are available on the system, as I mentioned before. And you can see actually that Phenomatrix uh, phase one, phase two didn't actually really impact our, our positivity negativity rate. So it's pretty consistent with what our MLTs had been doing before, before their implementation. Okay, so I want to specifically talk a little bit about um, the improved incubation conditions because this is something you're gonna see and other labs have actually commented on in, in the user forums. It's something, it's a really interesting phenomenon that we weren't really, I think we were expecting, but we didn't expect what the outcome or the impact really would be for our lab. So you do have improved incubation conditions, and this is great from the idea of increasing sensitivity because you can increase the isolation of fastidious pathogens. So Aerococcus, 
is a classic example. And on the left-hand side, you see this red line that's pre and post implementation. Uh, and we had about a two-fold increase in our aerococcus isolation after the implementation of WASP labs. The downside is because we have increased sensitivity, increased cult culture incubation conditions, that doesn't apply just to pathogens, it applies to non-neuropathogens as well, which included improved isolation of um, things like lactobacillus. So we had that decreased specificity. And one of the challenges on the right is you'll see that aerococcus and lactobacillus look almost identical under just like their colonial morphology appearance on the plate. So it's quite a challenge. Uh, our reports for lactobacillus increased tenfold. Normally, and before WASP lab, what we would do is we would do a grand stain to say, okay, is this kind of the smear of organism? Is this a lactobacillus, which is shown in that gram stain on the left? Or is it potentially aerococcus, um, which is the gram stain that's shown on the right-hand side? Um, it would be incredibly challenging to do that for 10 times more. And the whole point of this technology is to really add efficiency in the lab. And this was a potential uh, decreased efficiency if we kind of um, didn't find a way to manage it. So it, yeah, sorry, it just would have been re work and resource intensive. Just wanna really reiterate that. So what we decided to do is really look at this from the lens of like clinically what's important here. So true lactobacillus in the UTI is exceedingly rare in healthy individuals and it's a common vaginal commensal in women of childbearing age. That chart at the left, you'll see is just demonstrating this. This is data from our um, lab information system that shows like, yes, we have this kind of almost normal distribution with a long trailing line to the right for by age. This shows lactobacillus is really isolated around women of childbearing age. Aerococcus, on the other hand, is a rare but true pathogen that can cause severe disease, mostly in the elderly, immunocompromised, and in males. And what we really see with aerococcus based on our data and there's lots of case reports and peer reviewed published literature to support this is you start to see it more in the elderly population and that's what our data is kind of demonstrating. So taking this in mind, we um, created an algorithm which basically is to look at the pinpoint haze observed in significant quantities. We ask the question if it's female aged 11 to 55 and if not, we'll perform a grand stain. So if it's unlikely to be lactobacillus, we're gonna say, okay, what could this potentially be? Is it potentially aerococcus? And if it is potentially aerococcus, we will perform uh, Vitex mass spectrometry identification and additional workup as needed. Which, uh, this, so basically just to summarize that, really significantly reducing my workload and the impact of that non-specific lacto uh, isolation. Okay, so I'm just gonna start wrapping things up. Uh, this is an image that was generated based on the prompt finish release, I need a vacation, because this was quite a slog to get through. Uh, and I actually thought this was just way too cool. I would hang this on my office, in my office on the wall. Uh, just a really nice, beautiful image, I think inspirational. So thanks AI for that. Um, I'm not gonna go through the implementation pearls in detail, but the one that I really wanna draw everybody's attention to, because I've kind of already summarized everything anyways, is point number six, which I haven't really addressed, which is making sure that you allocate adequate support resources to manage the equipment. I think one of the under things that we underestimated was how much um, TLC the equipment itself would need. So um, it's not just, you know, um, you're not just realizing the benefits of converting to automation. You still need some resources to manage like errors that might come up on the equipment or um, if there's a challenge, if it's gonna go down, you need to contact support like you need kind of some support to be planned out in that that way too, just to make sure that you're not going to be stretched too thin. So assign super users, account for FTE managed equipment, downtime planning, et cetera, is really important. All right, some of the limitations for automation and not AI. First off, machine-assisted interpretive algorithms are only as good as the data that trains them. Garbage in equals garbage out. So you really wanna make sure that whatever annotated result you're feeding that algorithm is is ironclad or else you're going to run into problems down the road. The second is that current machine assisted interpretive algorithms require human intervention. There's no auto release functionality uh, included um, at this point. So they're getting to the point maybe where we can get there, but they're not there yet. And then third point is there's currently no existing guidelines or best practice recommendations for validating automated systems or machine assisted interpretive algorithms. Our current custom algorithm was trained using, I think it was actually even more than this, it might have been 3,000 unique urine culture specimens. That is not feasible for all labs. We are a very high volume lab. That wasn't really too much of a problem for us. That might be impractical for many other labs. So what are the criteria for validating these systems? A lot of the times we don't know how the algorithm itself works. 
how can we be confident in the result and what's a, you know what's the right number for that is kind of a, a question that we grappled with. Um, so the future for microbiology, and these are my opinions, but um, I think, and these are the things that I'm excited for, again, it's kind of a, a passion project of mine. Uh, large language models, I'm really excited to see how labs are gonna start to use these in the future. I added some references for interest in case you wanted to review uh, some of the work that's going on. I have no time to go through them in detail, unfortunately, but um, I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for these large language models to replace or supplement a lot of administrative work that's done in the lab. So maybe SOP writing, generating templates, things like that, that can get you not replace work again, but get you down the right path to help you um, as a supportive function, just to kind of reiterate that. Um, microscopy imaging. So just like I've talked a lot about culture imaging, microscopy is not lagging too far behind. Um, gram stain over and parasite machine assisted interpretation is something that already is kind of hitting a lot of labs. And I think I, I would expect that to grow in the future. And the last is analytics. Um, we're always gonna be doing our QC, QA activities, but one thing that's kind of an exciting concept is our, our lab information systems have a ton of information in them, right? Um, what, how can we leverage the data that's present in these systems for continuous quality assurance? For example, if I see an abnormally high proportion of E. coli isolated in my urine cultures, is that due to sheer chance or is there actually maybe a problem grumbling along that I need to look into? And I think that's something that AI would be able to support with. Pattern recognition and association studies for large data sets is also kind of a, you know easy win for AI. Microbiome analytics is a classic example of how this might be utilized. And lastly, the kind of implications to labs and public health in general, you're going to be able to increase the ability to cultivate fastidious pathogens, increase clinical sensitivity for all labs, including um, reference and public health. So you're gonna have improved accuracy and potentially patient outcome, which is one kind of the major benefits. On the flip side, you have the potential for decreased specificity to impact in microbial stewardship, prescribing practices. How are labs treating um, these additional results? Is that positivity rate increase? Is that clinically relevant or not? Like, are we actually getting more clinically sensitive? And I think the jury's still out on that one. I'd like to look into that a little bit more. Is this like all, uh, all a good thing or should we be kind of questioning that as well? Um, and one other kind of big questions I have is, you know, does the, if you're using these types of incubators that are contained, do the positive threshold for urine cultures need to shift? And I just would love to end this talk in acknowledging the amazing team that was responsible for implementing the ROS lab uh, and Phenomatrix. And just uh, front right here is our amazing technical specialist, Leah Brown, who really led the project on RS. Uh, and our managers uh, in the back right there, uh, Alexandra Park. Thanks for both of those in folks in particular. Um, and I think I have my references here. And if I have some time for question, I would be happy to try and address them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lee, for that super fun and informative presentation. So I will say, uh, over Christmas, we asked ChatGPT to read us the start of the night before Christmas from the view of a microbiologist. And insultingly, they did it through the view of a cellular biologist. So <laughs> We still have jobs uh, to do that subject, uh, subject expert review. Uh, so we'll now move on to the Q&A segment of the event to address some of the questions from our audience. So if you have not done so yet, please continue to enter your questions to the Q&A pod. Uh, and we have um, a couple of questions to go through. So the first kind of was along the same question that I had. So you started with urines, um, always for obvious reasons. What is your next specimen that you'll validate or verify? And the question is, um, do you have plans to expand the phenol matrix to other culture types, such as still cultures? Um, and is there capacity for the labs to work with vendors to develop custom algorithms based on specific differential or select plays that are used in the lab? Yeah, I, I think um, that's a great question. And um, we're absolutely looking at different ways to leverage our, our system in place. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, really getting the uh, the hardware in place is kind of the big hurdle. And once it's there and you have the AI algorithm or the cat that capability, the telebacterology where you can feed images to an AI algorithm, you can start thinking about how am I gonna develop this and expand our current test offering. So we're always looking at opportunities to expand the, um, the specimen type that we process on the, on the WASP lab. 
our major challenge right now is actually capacity, surprisingly. So even though we have a very large system, our volumes are so high that we are almost at capacity or close to capacity. So we have to make some challenging decisions on what the next kind of thing to implement would be. But the next kind of low hanging fruit, it's always for us gonna be what's the, going to be the easiest to implement, like technically and volume driven. Where are, gonna, where are we gonna realize the most FTE benefits and efficiencies in switching from a manual to an automated process? Um, in our experience, with the Pheno matrix and just the machine learning algorithm that we're using, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. And there's been a lot of back and forth between us and the vendor on ways to optimize the system, a lot of interest to maybe make the system the, the best it can be to get the results we want. And we're, we're constantly tweaking and in conversation with them to make that happen. And we're actually, I think, very close to adding kind of a, a next iteration of the software in our lab to improve the um, agreement between uh, Pheno Matrix and, and MLTs. Uh, and I imagine that the other vendors that are out there are, are just the same, like where they want to work with developing the algorithm. I think there's some benefits from, these are all commercial tests. They're very complicated, the algorithms that are generated, but there's interest from the vendor perspective as well, because anything that they develop can be applied to any lab um, outside of the lab that you're using or your current lab. And so along those lines, are the computer algorithms being updated um, and how frequently are they being updated to improve accuracy as you continue to use the automation? So they're not being continually updated. It's really a user-defined type thing. Yeah, we would approach them for an update. So there's a, I there's a question, I think, just to clarify one of the pieces that you mentioned. So um, in the computer analysis of the growth pattern, um, is the algorithm classified, sorry, let me just read it, and then uh, applying the developed pattern recognition algorithm to classify the observed growth. So is the system using um, the computer analysis of the growth pattern to define that pattern recognition? But I think what you said, it was like it's being trained from um, the sets that you had put in previously. Yeah, so basically what's happening is it's very similar to Starfish analogy I gave at the very start, you're, you're annotating whatever the result is for that plate. And then that result in that image is being fed through the machine learning. And it's going to look at patterns. I have no idea what, you know, the computer doesn't know what it is. It's just saying, I think I see pink colonies and they look like, I, I don't know, again, the details of how that works, but it's looking at the patterns that are on the plate. Then say, yes, I have an association between this type of a colony with let's say E. coli or this type of you know mixed growth with the mixed growth kind of result that the user is expecting. And that's it's looking at pattern recognition and that's how it's, it's kind of working through the machine learning. Thanks. Um, so another good question about how the, the images and the plates are interpreted. So it's about QA. So are the QA or QC characteristics such as um, media lot numbers, temperatures and gain time included in the training data set? And are they also included in the live data to insist with the interpretation? I don't believe that the media law expiry date and things like that are being um, used. I don't, there, I don't, there, I actually know that there's no, um, like the image is being acquired of the culture growth. I don't think it's taking anything that's based on like kind of, kind of on the back of the plate, you might see an expiry date and things like that. So I don't believe it's using anything like that. And we would have, we, we check our media before we load it onto the WASP lab system to make sure it's not expired before we start using it. Um, our volumes are very high, so we're constant. I think the oldest our media is, is like a few days or weeks. It's, it's very constantly new media that's being replaced. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to run through the questions quickly because we've got a bunch just in. Uh, we have a resident who wants to know what you're most excited, what AI analytical platform you're most excited about and if you've used Microsoft Copilot. I haven't, no, I haven't used Copilot, but I'm very interested. Um, that, because I, I think it's, it's, it's the tedious work that I'm really excited about for large language models. And I think Copilot is kind of like that generative type of um, uh, application, which can take an input and give you an output. And I, again, I'm not hoping it's going to replace the ability to create things like SOPs, but it can, like if you, for example, if I want to make a blood culture SOP and there's updated guidance, could I feed it through and kind of get a summary to start working with instead of starting from scratch? Um, very interested to try to see how it performs. I have no idea how it's going to perform. One of the risks, I had a, I had a point about um, 
the risks of generative AI, they're not perfect. I took it out because I didn't talk too much about the large language models, but they are, um, they can basically give you, um, what is it, like grammatically correct nonsense, in a, if that makes sense. So it can sound good, but the content isn't actually meaningful. And that's one of the things you have to be really careful with, with things like probably Copilot, I haven't tried, ChatGBT. It can sound great, confidently incorrect is another way to say it, I think. Uh, but it's actually giving you improper information. So you really need somebody with knowledge and understanding of like guidelines, best practice recommendations to ensure like, yes, the content's correct and it's right. But um, I think it's gonna get to the point where it will be very close almost to a human. I don't think we're there yet, but I think it will be. And I'm very excited to, to try more work with large language models. I will say as uh, one other thing uh, for things like chat GPT, large language models, that they're excellent at technical things. Like if you need help with an Excel document, you have a question, whatever you're trying to do, it saves my, it saved me a number of times. Like I'm having trouble changing the date format in Excel. How do I do it? And it can give a pretty good answer with examples. Thanks. Uh, the next question is about kind of data and, and part of the verification process. So if we have different labs using the same culture plates for the same reason, so let's say everybody's using the same chromogenic plate for a, uh, urine culture, can sharing data across labs improve the overall accuracy of the software? And if so, is it easy to access and share software data across the labs? Potentially, uh, I would say it really depends on the workflow. So you, your AI algorithm is very custom. It's custom to your process in your lab. Um, I'm not gonna bring the slides back up, but I, it's gonna be in the slide deck. We have a uh, criteria for our colony count interpretation and that includes less than or greater than 50. There's only a few other labs that I've ever seen that include that. We have reasons, but I'm not going to get into the detail of. But if your if your interpretive SO, like SOP guidance interpretation criteria are the exact same as ours, and the incubators are the same, I could imagine that it'd be pretty similar. But you would still have to go through the verification. I, I would err on the side of caution, just train the model. Maybe you could get away with doing fewer images, um, but you would have to probably do some sort of training to make sure you're getting consistency. Okay, I'm going to come by the next three questions because they're technical and ask them all at once. It's about the wasp. So uh, how frequently, do you know how frequently it breaks down? Uh, as in, do you need a, a, someone there to observe and, and troubleshoot? Um, have you trained, have you explored training phenome matrix to, to learn beta hemolysis since throats are your second most common specimen? And has Copen added an outdoor to the incubator? Okay, so the first one, um, I would say that there were certainly some growing pains associated with the transition. Um, the, tech, the technology itself, in terms of the hardware, seems to be performing pretty well now, but it took time to get there. And there was a lot of lessons learned along the way, uh, operationally, um, for example, setting up a um, spare parts cabinet so that if we had a breakdown, we didn't have to wait a day for a spare part to be available before it can be replaced. It was already in the lab and we can go up for it replace it. So we had to characterize a lot of the reasons things were breaking down and then, you know, say, okay, we need these parts available and then you know, whatever, there's growth through it. And eventually it's performing a lot better now than it was, but it does need a lot of handholding still to make sure that the, um, you know, alarms or, or error messages are being addressed quickly to prevent delays. Uh, the second question was about beta hemolysis and throats. Yes, we're, that would be our second <laughs> type of media to look at implementing. And we probably would move to a chromogenic media if we wanted to do that. Uh, and then the third question is, so Copan in exploring adding um, like an access door to the smart incubators, I think was the question. And they actually do, you can access the smart incubators from the back. I don't actually know if the technologists can, but the engineers can, they can get back into the incubators. There's a lot of robotics in there that you probably don't want to muck around with um, at the end of the day. So I, okay. I wouldn't go in there myself, but <laughs> it's there. Uh, thanks so much, Lee. And unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our session. And as we wrap up today's PHO microbiology rounds, I just want to sincerely thank you, uh, Lee, for presenting. I would also like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. So you can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO microbiology round survey for today's session. So please, please, please try to complete this as it really does help improve our programming. As a reminder to everyone, topic, the Ontario Public Health Convention will be held on March 26th and April 3rd in 2024. So please check out topic.ca for details. Lastly, to access past PHO presentations and to view confirmed and upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education events and click on presentations. So thank you again, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.